and we are back and we're jumping right into our second conversation. We are joined by the Commissioner of Police, Chester Williams, and we are going to be discussing the state of emergency which was uh, issued by the Governor General last week. Good morning, uh, Commissioner. Good morning, Council, and uh, good morning, <laughs> Marlene, and good morning to your viewers across the country. Yes, and you know, thank you very much for joining us. We do appreciate you coming to take the time to discuss this because of course, this is, especially for the residents of Belize City, something that has been a major concern since um, it has happened last week. Now, I guess we can start our conversation by jumping into the reasons for the declaration because as we know, this state of emergency is an extraordinary measure and um, people, of course, want to know what, why the situation called for it um, at this time. Well, um, as I've said before in other forum with the media, that we had seen a trend, or we were seeing a trend, where the, some elements of the society were engaged in some very violent robberies. And then we have some calls for extortion. And then we had the, the shootings that were picking up in Belize City between three rivaling groups. We are still in a pandemic. And so the police's human resources and other resources is stretched to its limit, trying to see how best we can keep our country um, to a great extent <laughs> with the least amount of COVID cases that we possibly can have, while still focusing on our core policing function. And so there is no time for us to be babysitting no criminals in the sense that what we used to do in the past, um, put police officers in the different gang-ridden areas um, with a view to see how we can contain the activities of these gang members. But in a time like this, we don't have that resources. And uh, we have also found that when we do put police officers in a gang within areas, one, we leave the law-abiding citizens without police, and the, the, the criminal elements go and commit crime within the law-abiding citizens' community, and goes back into their haven, secured or protected by the police. That is one. Two, they tend to go leave the area, go to other areas, do shootings, commit murders, then come back into their safe haven knowing that their rivals will not come there because police is there to protect them. So I no longer ascribe to that style of policing because for me, it is more creating a safe haven for criminals to operate more freely. Mm -hmm. And so when it is that they started with their shooting and the, the murders and these um, violent um, robberies, we had to do something to give the Belizean people some sense of security. And uh, I know some might say, but what happened to police investigation? And uh, as I've said before, our investigation and our intelligence have been on point in terms of who are the perpetrators of these crimes. But our difficulty is the fear that they instill in witnesses that prevents the witnesses from coming forward to reduce to us what they may have seen in writing so that we can charge these people. So the fact that they instill fear in their perpetrate, in their um, victims and uh, witnesses, it ties our hands from dealing with them from the other aspect of the law going through an arrest and then a court process. Mm -hmm. And even in circumstances where we do get to that point where an arrest is made, the person reduce whatever they see into writing and we make an arrest. When that matter goes before the court, the witnesses are threatened. When court date comes, no witness will show up because of the fact that they are threatened. And then what happens? The perpetrator walks right out of court free. So they operate on this free will that, you know what? I can't go to jail because nobody attacked me because they're afraid. So they just continue to do what they want. Are we supposed to then sit back as we're impotent and sterile? Or are we supposed to do what is necessary, applying other measures to be able to ensure that we put a stop to what is happening mm -hmm. 
and give our law-abiding citizen that sense of peace and security that they so rightly deserve. Okay. I, I'm telling you, we were, we were reaching a point where people were, were, were starting to become terrified. There were some people were, were traumatized. When you look at, for example, the, the, the um, robbery at Scotia Bank in Belize City, these people were firing shots in an area that was uh -huh, that had so many people moving around. They had no regards to nobody. So why must we be so soft in dealing with them when they don't have no <laughs> no regards in terms of what it is that they're doing or the effect that they're causing on the lives of our law-abiding citizens? No. And in fact, I think. You know, I, I hear what you're saying in, in the level of fear that exists in especially Belize City. However, we're moving into our fourth, this is our fourth state of emergency where suspected gang members are held detained for an entire month without being charged. Third. Right? Third. It's a third? Yes. Okay. So it is a temporary fix, no matter how effective it is because they're physically unable to leave the, the prison, it is a temporary fix. So I think the question for uh, the rest of the citizens is what does happen with the other policing? What else will be done to be able to address the situation of crime, especially those perpetrated by the people you say are involved in gangs? Marlene, we always hear the talk about temporary fix. A temporary fix is better than no fix at all, one. And two, what permanent fix could there be to okay. people who, let me just finish, yeah. to people who are raised in a certain lifestyle, people who just have this propensity to want to be violent. I don't see what the state or the police could do to fix some of these young men. I don't see what could be done. Now, we might look at things and uh, point fingers. That's the, e that's the easiest thing to do, pointing fingers. But at the end of the day, when we try to look at lasting solutions, I think that we need to start in the homes. Because at the end of the day, don't the police raise these young men? They're not the state raised them, that a parent raised them. And in many cases, you find that these children behave the way they behave because of the fact that they were raised in a home where the parents, to some extent, tolerate them with that lifestyle. Yes, I can tell you there are some who we know their parents do not tolerate them, but because of peer pressure, they fall into line. We could understand those. But majority of them, it's what the parents tolerate. You watch when things happen. Who go and cry on TV? The mother, my son, innocent, my lee boy, this, my baby, this. Then they're not baby, they're not lee boy. Then they commit big man crime, and they need to be dealt with like big man. Agreed. Here is the issue. I understand, and I've heard, I've heard you give, it, give the same example before in looking at the, the family structure. Um, and where uh, families may have been falling short in how they have raised their children. But I want to go back to how m you essentially are able to remove criminals from the street, and that's by using the law. Mm -hmm. We have seen over the years where there have been beefed up legislation, uh, penalties increased, uh, burden of proof lessened for gang-related activities to be taken to the courts. But here we don't see people charged. I'm trying to understand how you find 100 young men, or about 100, whatever number, who are being detained without being charged for being a part of a gang, when being a part of a gang is a crime in itself. How do you explain that? Marlene, I, I, I will outrightly refute the comment you made just a while ago. You and I know, because I, I, I watch you every night on the news as a news anchor, and you have reported immensely on gang members who are charged. Mm -hmm. So to say that they are not charged is not true. We have charged a number of these gang members under the gang legislation. I don't want to be critical of the courts, 
Some of them have gone to the courts, they pled guilty, and they were just given a fine and sent home. That's the prerogative of the, of the magistrate. We wish that would not have been the case, because as you rightly alluded to, <laughs> being a gang member is an offense. Mm -hmm. You get convicted, you plead guilty, <laughs> then you're sent back into society. It's like saying to you, go continue to be a gang member. When we would prefer that incarceration would be the penalty. But we don't control what happens in the judiciary. What we need to do is to continue to do investigations on them, hoping that we will be able to charge them a second time. And uh, if that happens, I am sure that the courts is going to have a different view in terms of how they're going to um, deal with sentencing them. And uh, it is not easy to just say that you're going to charge somebody with an offense. Gavin will tell you, you have to ensure that you have the, the relevant evidence. Because if you just charge somebody for charging somebody sick, then that is tantamount to malicious prosecution. And we cannot do that. And so it takes a, a, a lengthy investigation process to be able to get at the relevant information against them. Because it's not like some of them are openly professing to be a member of a gang. No, they're not. It requires very, very hard work and a lot of hours to be able to get the information against them. And so we do that. When it comes to the issue as it relates to the burden of proof, again, as an attorney, Gavin will tell you that while the Constitution in Section 6, Subsection 10 do make provision for a reverse burden in certain circumstances, it has a lot to do with the gravity of the sentence. So if, if there is an offense that carries a very severe penalty, the courts are going to say no. You cannot place this burden on the accused person. It must be the state. And we start in the case of Vasquez VR, where the court eventually reduced um, the, the burden to an evidential burden rather than a burden of proof. So we have to look at things from a legal standpoint. And I'm sure that when it comes to drafting of legislations and these sort of things, the, the, the drafter don't just draft for drafting's sake. You should not make laws in vain. And so they have to draft laws with penalties that are realistic, with a burden of proof that is realistic. So while, yes, we'd like to see a lessened degree of burden being placed on these gang members, the penalty of being a member of a gang is 25 to 40 years. Mm -hmm. So it, it cannot be such that you will say to the gang member, you must prove that you are not a gang, that the state must prove that you are a gang member. Um, but, you know, speaking about the Constitution, just um, because we are speaking of a state of emergency now, yes where certain rights are suspended mm -hmm. and because as Marlene alluded to earlier there have been multiple states of emergency and a lot of what you spoke of earlier in terms of the gang culture and you know the home life these are these are systemic problems that of course require multifaceted approaches to solution to, to find solutions but I think the major concern is that we're seeing successive use of what is supposed to be an extraordinary power and perhaps the message that it might send is that well the police are under a week that you know we've lost control of the situation and therefore we need to do this and this is a quick fix how would you respond to the people who say that i think that the people who say that are naive and um <laughs> we have to be real we live in a real world you know People raise their children in such a way that they become violent for a lengthy period of time, all their life, per se. And expect that one encounter or two encounters with the police is going to change that person. It doesn't work like that. And uh, it's not a matter of losing control, but I believe I explained at length earlier why we saw the need to go down this route. We cannot live in a society where the majority of our people are being held hostage by a very few. Simply because the very few strive on instilling fear in people so that they can continue to foster their criminal activity. The Constitution, I'm sure, was written with the view that 
one day would have encountered these circumstances. And uh, the state must, like I said before, must be able to have something that they can use to ensure that law and order is restored. The state cannot sit idle by and uh, watch people, watch a few, terrorizing the majority. It cannot work that we will live in a, in a democracy and at the end of the day, while some might say, I, I have seen where um, a certain attorney is advertising on Facebook. <laughs> you and I know that the Legal Profession Act forbids advertising where this attorney is proposing to provide legal advice or legal assistance to these people who have been incarcerated. It seems to me as if some people strive on the violence. They want the violence to continue so that they can continue to make a living. But at the end of the day, it is on them. I believe that the state of emergency is going to help some mothers keep their child alive much longer. Because if they remain, if they had remained on the streets, continuing this, the, the lifestyle that they were <laughs> engaged in, some of them would not live to see the month that they, the month or longer that they may remain in prison. So at the end of the day, some of them are going to be grateful. For now, yes, they may be upset, but you have to understand that there is a thing in life that is called tough love. You cannot always be too staff with your children because at the end of the day, being too staff at times is tantamount to condoning the activities that they're engaged in. Commissioner, I, I hear what you're saying and it seems to me that, that in, your, in your work that you do, you're encountering parents perhaps that are challenging um, your impression of, of their children. Mm -hmm. But let's be fair. You know, parents are responsible for parenting, um, and you are responsible for policing. So let's, I, I, I'm trying to understand how you keep on speaking of the state of emergency like it has fixed the problem. In 30 days, or in less now, it'll be what, three weeks? It will expire. Then these young men go back into the streets. Who said so? You going to release them? Is it a 30-day state of emergency? We don't know. We never say it's 30 days. 30 days in the first instance. And then? <laughs> it could be extended. If? What, what makes you decide if it'll be extended? Well, that's a matter that we're going to deal with when that time comes. But no one says it's only 30 days this time. These are young men uh -huh. that have not been charged for mm. anything. Uh -huh. and so what's the point? At the end of 30 days, you simply decide whether or not you'll keep them for longer? We will decide on that Based when on the what? time comes. I, I don't need to go through that here right now, but when that time comes, that will be decided. Well, I but think at the end of the day, as I said before, and I, I, I offer no apology for what I say, Marlene. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you see, people can sit on the side and criticize. That's the easiest thing to do. I dare any one of them who criticized me mm -hmm. to come and sit in my shoe or stand in my shoe. And uh, I see if they, go, if they are going to do a better job. You talk about fix. What do you envision as a long-term fix, if I may ask you? Well, Commissioner... So we, we, could, we could sit and criticize, you know. Well, Commissioner, but I think... at the end of the day, <laughs> we must look at solutions that is going to, to last. And at this very moment, as I said before, some of these young men, we have tried with them over and over and over and over and over and over again. They seem not to learn. There are some of them, I am very happy to say, that we have seen them taking that curve. We still continue to work along with them through CYDP, through Baranuri, who is doing um, interventions and mediation, through Francisco Woods. Now, I, I spoke with Mr. Woods yesterday, and he said to me that, Ms. Deborah C. will have now secured funding that is going to now provide some employment for them in the sense that we are now looking to maybe look at um, car wash, blacks making uh, machine um, or factory, different things that they can be employed. We have some of them that we have seek employment for at um, um, State Bank Project. So we are trying. 
But at the end of the day, we can only do so much. So it's not for lack of trying on my part or on the part of many other people. We have tried with them. But what must we do with those who do not want to try and just want to live that life out there to make easy money and terrorize people? But I think that was, I mean, that goes to the heart of Marlene's question because when you speak to, about detaining people having not, who have not been charged, I mean, at the end of the day, the legal system is designed such that one, there's a presumption of innocence and also that prison or incarceration is supposed to be the last step. You know, you've gone through the trial, you've you know, established your burden, you've, whatever, you've proven that the person is guilty and therefore the judge or whoever it is will decide that this is what the person is supposed to spend in terms of a, you know, sentence, uh, a term of incarceration. We've leapfrogged all of that and we've s said that based on information, uh, we are going to detain these people. Second of all, you suggested earlier that it could be for longer. And at the heart of the issue, a state of emergency is supposed to be some, it, it, the, the, the power is supposed to only be invoked in very extraordinary circumstances when you have earlier outlined that this is just the situation in terms of the culture, in terms of the crimes that these people have committed, that at the end of the day, we're still gonna have these problems, so is it that we will always be so, under a state of emergency? So, Gavin, having the masses of our people terrorized and living in fear due to the actions of a few is not extraordinary circumstances, I beg to differ. While you spoke to the legal process that an accused person goes through, the Constitution in Section 18 do makes provision for a leapfrog of that process. And that is what we're doing. So whatever it is that is being done is also sanctioned by the same constitution. So for those who speak that what we're doing is unconstitutional, I say to them, it only is if the constitution is inconsistent with its own self. Because the power is given by the constitution to do it. And it outlines the procedures. So at the end of the day, what is being done is provided for in the Constitution. Again, I feel like we are in the same place in the conversation. And, and let, me, let me reword the question, and, and you can be able to respond. The issue here is that to get a handle on crime, it takes more than a state of emergency. Whether you know, who wants to argue, and you are clearly defending that your state of emergency is what is needed at this time, possibly for 30 days, somebody will decide, maybe you or the AG, at the end of 30 days whether it will be extended. But there will be a time where these young men will have to be released. Looking at strategies to be able to address crime is what your mandate is. You are the commissioner of police, you head up all the different departments. At one point, your push was primarily looking at community policing. You worked with the gangs, you talked with the gangs. I know from previous conversations you've said that that didn't work out, that they didn't take it seriously enough. So what else are you looking at to be able to mitigate the situation of crime? Marlene, there is a lot that we have done. We have a crime fighting strategy that we apply every day. But we must understand and I, I trust and hope my learned friend is going to agree with me here, that as much as one may say that the criminal justice system is founded on three pillars, law enforcement, prosecution, and uh, the courts. And sorry, law enforcement, the courts, and the prison. I have always said that we need to add a fourth component to that the society. Because the wheels of justice do not turn where the society do not cooperate. If a crime is committed against you and you do not come to the police and give a statement, the police cannot charge a perpetrator. If you come to the police and give a statement, the prosecution cannot prosecute that offender without you. So you'll find that if it is that we want to talk about 
an effective strategy to fight crime. The society needs to, need to be a very important part of that strategy because the police is not everywhere to see every crime that is committed. It is the society who sees the crime being committed and where they don't say to the police who investigate what they saw, then how can the police effect arrest? It is not going to work. So many of the persons who criticize the police and say that we don't investigate are the ones who really and truly need to be criticized for failure to cooperate with the system. But we try as best as we can to understand the reason why they don't want to cooperate. But do not take that your fear to be the reason for you to say that the police is not doing their work. We have a very good crime fighting strategy. But if the people who are supposed to work with us do not work with us, it, it will not be worth the paper it is written on. Mm -hmm. It must be a dual component. So I from what? Uh, sorry, I just, wanted, I just wanted to ask very quickly because we are running out of time. We are already out of time. But, <laughs> but um, I think it is important only because it has been discussed very much in the media, the concerns of the residents who are actually living in these areas. Um, there have been allegations of you know, malicious targeting of persons, persons who are, who are claiming that the police, I mean, of course, police brutality is always an issue, um, notwithstanding the state of emergency. But w I want a bit, you know, to give you a chance to respond to persons who have gone on record to state that uh, a lot of it is just abuse, a lot of it is targeted, a lot of, some of it is police officers taking their personal beef out on other persons and therefore their loved ones and so have been detained and that a lot of the targeting even just of the south side and the declaration of the area is discriminatory so I just want to give you a chance to respond to some of those allegations. I don't even know if I should dignify that with an answer but since you ask let me say that I'm not going to sit and uh, be naive to say that police brutality do not exist. It do exist. But many a time, some of the people who cry wolf about police brutality, they only tell the media a portion of what the media wants to know. That is going to make their story look good. They don't say what they did that triggers the police to act in a certain way. They don't. But we live in a society where there seems not to be some people who are independent thinkers. As they see something negative, everybody jump on that bandwagon. Do not try to ascertain for themselves what may have happened that led to whatever circumstance or situation they may be seeing. But at the end of the day, Gavin, when it comes to the whole issue with the state of emergency. If you were to take a walk on South Side Belize City and you ask the law abiding citizens who are the majority, because as much as I said South Side bad, 99.9% .9 of South Side people are good people. You ask them how do they feel about the state of emergency and you tell me what the answer is going to be. My friend, right there, pass outside. I could bet you he feel happier going home now. He feel more safer going home now. People want to live in peace. And uh, we have a responsibility to ensure that we do what we need to do to make our law-abiding citizens live in peace. Anything less is a disservice to our people. And I stand behind that. And on the issue of police brutality? I said just a while, I addressed that just a while ago. I'm not saying that there is none, there is some. But some of them are just people who are crying wolf to try and cover what they're doing. They only show a portion of what happened. They show what the police did. And they omit to show what they did to trigger the police to act in a certain, in a certain way. But there are indeed some cases where police outright abuse their powers. And uh, where that is the case, we ensure that we take swift and decisive action to address those. Yeah. 
Now, before we, we end off the conversation, you know, one of the things that, that we have heard um, as a part of the conversation coming from the police and the wider community is that given the economic stresses that people are going through, it can be a time where there will be an increase of crime. Um, I know at one point you'd worked very closely with the business sector to try to get them into kind of preventative, protective mode. Um, is that something that's also happening at this time? And, and what do you say to uh, citizens about their security? Well, of course, we, we always try to give tips to the business mm -hmm. community with a view to ensure that they too do their part in ensuring their safety. And uh, especially now with the wearing of masks, where I heard, uh, I heard a friend that he said, he said, I couldn't believe that a day would come that I would go into a bank <laughs> to a teller with a mask on and <laughs> to get money. And it is true, right? But the masks have become a part of our norm. Mm -hmm. And uh, with that, the criminal elements are also taking advantage, mm -hmm. right? To conceal their identities while committing crime. And so, we have to ensure that we do our part with a view to sensitize the, the business community, especially who are the targets of robberies, as it relates to what they can do to protect themselves. Yeah. And I got a call from a f financial institution the other day where the manager said to me that a customer came in with a ski mask and uh, the customer was denied entry. And the customer went tough and said, oh, you're violating my constitutional rights and this, that, that. And so I said to the, to, the, to the manager of that institution, I said, that is your policy that nobody must wear a certain type of mask. You continue to enforce that policy. If a matter of fact, I would even go farther to tell some of the business places that if a person comes in with a mask and a cap and a sunshade, make them take out the cap and the sunshade, make them look in our camera before they come in, mm -hmm. right? I, I, I love what um, LA Fashions did as much as um, I know Gavin and I would want to go and buy something there, but <laughs> they said no men allowed, right? And so at the end of the day, we respect that. But it goes back to the fact that some business places are so much in fear that they don't even want to see guys in the establishments because guys are the threat, right? So I, I, I believe that much has been done with a view to prevent these robberies from occurring. And we are going to continue to work with the business people and the wider society with a view to ensure that we keep them safe. Mm -hmm. Let me say that this Wednesday, which is tomorrow, we're having, for the first time, Citizens Appreciation Day, yeah. right? And again, you know, we couldn't do police week because of the, the, the COVID situation and the expense that it is going to cost on us. And so we decided that we're going to do something more simple. But we want it not to be about us. Yeah. We want it to be about the citizens, to show appreciation to the citizens for the support that they have given us over the years. And so I'm looking forward to tomorrow. I believe it's going to be a very, very good day for us with all the, 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 the um, black eye we have taken in the media, especially last week. Um, I think that Citizen Appreciation Day is timely, where we can showcase that, you know what, we do have good police officers who care, yeah. and to show our gratitude to the wider public for the support that they have given us. Okay. I, I know that that celebration comes up, and we're looking forward to it as yes. well. Just one final point before uh, you do go, because I know you have to go. <laughs> um, but, but just talk, up, talk to me about police presence in border communities. Yes. Um, that is a... a, a a hell of a stressful thing to deal with, I must say. Um, we have, and we continue to try, along the border areas, mm -hmm. um, the police and the BDF, trying to prevent these border jumpers mm -hmm. and uh, these contrabandits from coming into the country. But you know, Marlene, that... <laughs> the border is so porous and so wide. That's what I was going to ask. How difficult yes. is it to police? It is extremely difficult. There are several blind spots. I, I listen to people on social media and they say, oh, they could um, cover all the blind spots. Believe you me, if we cover all the blind spots, we'll have police to police the interior of the country. It's, it's often like much. in yards and... Yes, and um, we continue to do what we can. Um, with the recent occurrences in the area, we will be stepping up our presence another two notch. Natchez, with a view to as much as we can prevent 
the border jumpers some coming in. The BDF have um, four patrol boats in the Rio Hondo, patrolling between that San Victor, Santa Cruz, and Douglas area, all with a view to avert these border jumpers. Mm -hmm. But like I said, the area is extremely wide, and uh, people do find a way to do what they want to do at times. We must be the one to uh, try to develop strategies with a view to see how we can um, to a great extent minimize what is taking place. And so we're going to do that. How, how much have you had the buy-in from the community members in being able to report when someone enters um, or leaves? I, I'm very glad you asked that question because I think today we'll be having five hotlines set up. I, I spoke to um, BTL and I spoke to SMART. And BTL is going to give us three hotlines and SMART is going to give us two. Mm -hmm. And those hotlines are going to be installed at the Raccoon Street Police Station. They'll be manned on a 24 hours basis by police officers. And it will be used for persons to report border jumpers and uh, contrabandists. So anybody who sees, anybody who just believes is a border jumper and is in their area, they can call the police. We're going to get the Ministry of Health involved and we move in to secure that person. If a C person with contraband, you call the police, we move in and we deal with it. So these are things that we'll be doing. And uh, to complement that, I, we are also working on two infomercials. Mm -hmm. One that will address border jumpers and uh, one that is going to address contrabandists. Mm -hmm. And we're going to do these infomercials in both Spanish and English. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have those aired on the media um, so that people could understand what it is that we're trying to do. And in addition to that, what we'll be doing as well, we're going to create a social media page mm -hmm. where, again, people can post things as it relates to these um, activities and at the same time have a messenger page mm -hmm. that people can um, anonymously send in pictures of persons who they know are border jumpers and um, contraband goods and these sort of things. You know? So we're trying to do what we can with a view to ensure that we have a good system in place to report persons who are engaged in these illegal activities. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming in and discussing just the work that you've been up to, and uh, we appreciate it. Best thank of you. luck. Thank you, Marlene, and thank you, Gavin. All right. It's always good to be here. And you'll keep me longer than I should have. I know. See, we, we <laughs> teach some time, but don't charge us. We're going to go ahead and take a, a break. When we come back, we're going to be joined by political analyst uh, Carolyn French-Sandefort to talk about when leadership changes. Please stay tuned.